So one of the ways that we can survive and thrive on this estate is by being part of a loving community that, that cares for one another, right? But it's hard to be part of that community sometimes when you feel you're really busy or you just feel really drained and depleted and really tired, right? And so like for me, for weeks, I've found that when it comes to Sundays, I've got so much work that I find it's really hard to be a blessing to other people because my Sundays are so busy. I'm like, oh, I just feel too stressed to be able to, to help people. And so then this week I was like, I'm gonna change my schedule. I'm gonna, whatever I gotta do, I'm gonna make it work so I have more time free on Sunday. And last night I went to bed really excited. I was like, tomorrow I'm gonna have more time to serve other people, this is great. And then what I found when I woke up, I found that although I had more time, I still was the same old me, in that I still had the same heart problems I can have that get in the way of serving people. I still get irritable, there's still ways where I might put my needs ahead of other people's needs and so on. And I think hopefully we can all identify with this, that when we talk about loving one another in a community, Sometimes the problem is time. We feel like we don't have enough time, but sometimes the problem is our own hearts. And sometimes we expend ourselves trying to help other people, but we end up not serving them in a good way because we get grumpy along the way. So we're gonna look at all of that today, right? So check it out. We're looking at the letter of Galatians. This was written 2000 years ago by the Apostle Paul to the church that we're in Galatia, right? And so it'd be like modern day Turkey. And in Galatians chapter six, verse 10, near the end of the letter, Paul says this to them. He says, therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to who? All people. all people. Let us do good to all people. And then he says, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. And if you remember the last few weeks, we've been seeing how in the Bible, you've got like a believing community of people who believe in God, and then you've got an unbelieving community. And here it's saying to the believing community, do good to all people. In other words, both communities, do good to the believing community and also do good to the unbelieving community, right? So we're not supposed to just focus on our own community, we're not supposed to just love people in the church. We're supposed to love people outside the church as well. And at the same time, it says, especially, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So in some ways, this is a bit like, some ways, if this like, if you have a child, you care for your child, you love your child, you do loving deeds for your child, you also love other children and you do good to other children, but you especially have a focus on the children in your family, right? And we, and we understand that's kind of normal. And what we also understand is for us, if in the believing community, if we have a special focus on doing good within this community and loving one another, it then actually helps us to love people outside because we're taking care of one another's needs, helping one another through difficult patches and all that. We're strengthening one another so that we can also be a blessing to people outside in that unbelieving community. <laughs> but notice this as well, in Galatians 6 verse 10, he's saying we should do good to them in the first bit, therefore, as we have what? Opportunity. So then the question is, what does that mean as we have opportunity? And I think there's two ways we could look at it, right? One way is that it's saying, as we have time. As we have time, do good to everyone. Another way of looking at it is to say, as opportunities present themselves. In other words, as you see people needing help, that's the sign for you to do good. And the reason why these two things I think are worth thinking about is each one of us has got our own default way of working out whether we do good or not. So some of us are time-based. Some of us are like, if I have time, I will help people. And that can work to a point, but it doesn't always work that great. 
So for example, if a parent, when their child says, can you read to me? If a parent says, no, I'm too busy right now, that might be okay. The parent might be being wise in that moment by saying, I'm too busy right now. But if every single time the parent says, I'm too busy, if every time the parent decides, I don't have time to read to my child right now, then that isn't good. That's not a good way of deciding whether you should be reading to your child. So time isn't always the best factor, especially because when we assess our time, we're not God, right? So sometimes we think we're really busy and we're not actually as busy as we think we are. Sometimes, some of the, sometimes we, we, we say we're really busy and sometimes we might have just watched through a box set on Netflix of something. And I'm not wanting to guilt anyone about that, but, but, but what I'm saying is someone else, when they say they're busy, they, they don't mean that they've also just watched a box set on Netflix. And again, I don't want to focus on the, that thing, but I just, I just want to say, how do you know whether you're too busy? How do you know if you're as busy as the next person? Like, time is a very tricky way of working out whether you should help people or not. <clears throat> But some of us, we don't work along timelines, we work along dessert lines. And I don't mean pudding, okay? I mean dessert-based help when you say, I think that person deserves my help, I will help them. But that person doesn't deserve my help, I won't help them. And again, that's a tricky way of trying to work out whether you should help people, because none of us are God. How, how do we really know if someone deserves our help? And does the Bible even teach only help people who deserve it? No, not really. It's something that comes from the Victorian age where people, a new term was invented called the deserving poor. And it was the idea that some, some of the poor people are deserving and some of them aren't deserving. And it doesn't actually come from the Bible. So dessert-based stuff isn't great. And then some of us, we help people based on our feelings, right? But if we're honest, our feelings can change really quickly. So choosing how to help people based on feelings, again, is a bit tricky. So what I want to say is that we help people as we have opportunity. Sometimes that means as we have time. Sometimes it does mean, do we have time to help right now? You know, so you could even one time be like, I'm bored. Hey, I've got time. Is there something I could do to help someone? Does someone need, have I got a friend who's so stressed right now I could help them out? You know, sometimes the time thing's helpful with that. But other times it's about seeing what opportunities have arisen that people in my life, people in my neighborhood or people in my church need help. And so what I want to say is that we need big eyes. We need big eyes, right? Uh, in one of Paul Miller's books, he talks about how you often see when Jesus interacts with people, it will say Jesus looked at them and then he da 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 da. And there's something about Jesus interacting with people where he'd actually look at people and he's looking at them and then he's helping them with their problem. And the same way we want to have big eyes where we're actually noticing, hey, what's your problem? And, you know, years ago, I was really sad. Many, many years ago, many, many years ago, and it's not talking about any of you in this room here, uh, a friend of mine came to church and she had a black eye. Um, and her partner had hit her and given her the black eye. And I'd spent time with her, um, helping her through this, and I was watching on the Sunday to see how people would respond, how they would help her. And at the end of the service, I said to one bloke, I said, did you, know, did you talk to so-and-so at all? And he's like, no, why? I was like, did you see she had a black eye? And he was like, no. And I was heartbroken. I was like, no, 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 we, 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 don't, want, we don't want women coming to our church with black eyes and we don't see that and that we don't, we don't help them, you know? And, but if I'm honest, there's plenty of times where I'm not noticing people's needs. And so we wanna ask God to give us big eyes that we actually notice people's needs and that we can really see the help that they need. And so what this means is that, let's say you got a friend that every Tuesday you text them, every Tuesday night you text them, 
to have a have a little catch up, right? And one Tuesday, you've had a terrible day at work. You're exhausted. You text your friend, say, sorry, mate, too tired to chat tonight, you know, and, and leave it like that. Now, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm not saying that would be a bad thing to do. If you're too tired, you, you're too tired. You need your rest and all that. But what I am saying is having big eyes might mean first texting them, you doing okay? And seeing what they say. And if they say, yeah, I'm cool, you could be like, oh, good. You know what? I'm really tired. Can we catch up next week? But if they respond and say, actually, I just got some really bad news from the doctor, then a need, an opportunity has presented itself. And it wouldn't be right, would it, for us to text back, ah, sorry about that, too tired to chat, chat next week. You know, now maybe you are really, really tired and you're like, look, I, I'm on the verge of some kind of breakdown here. Then, then you just text back saying, that is terrible. I'm not in a great place right now and I'm, I'm so exhausted. I want to be a real blessing to you. Can I catch up with you in a couple of days? Something like that, you know? And so what I'm getting at is in our individualistic society, we tend to think I've got this need right now I'm going to shy away from helping other people. But sometimes the people we shy away from have got an even bigger need than we have. So we want to have big eyes to see, has my friend got a bigger problem than me right now? Because if that is the case, I'm going to shelve my thing to, to help them. Okay. Now in Galatians 5.13, so this is the chapter before chapter 6 that we just looked at, right? In Galatians 5.13, Paul says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be what? free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Now in the Bible, when it talks about the flesh, sometimes it's talking about the realm of the flesh. It's talking about the way we used to live our lives before God gave us his Holy Spirit, before he changed our hearts. We walked around in the realm of the flesh doing what we want. And sometimes like we've seen in previous weeks, doing what the devil wants. Then when God gives you his spirit, you now walk in the realm of the spirit Often we also go back to the realm of the flesh and do the old ways when we shouldn't. He says, do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. You see why with your friend, at first you're thinking about how do I love myself because I'm really tired, but then you think I need to love my friend as well. So let me just check how my friend's doing. So I'm loving my neighbor as I love myself, right? And then in verse 15, it says, if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the who? Spirit. spirit. Walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the chapter before where Paul, the chapter, this chapter here is before the next bit where Paul says, do good to everyone. And here he's saying, you've got freedom. You've been set free by Jesus, but don't use that freedom to just do your own thing. Use your freedom to serve other people. And you might think that sounds really tiring, but then he says, walk by the Spirit. In other words, when we serve people, we do it with the Spirit's power, not our own power. So a lot of people are switching to solar panels now, right? Um, you probably can't do it on this estate if you were getting your hopes up. There's probably conservation laws about that. But maybe that will change, I don't know. But people are changing to solar power because they're like, look, I use electricity and gas for the energy, but the cost is too high. It's not worth it. I'm going to switch to solar power so I still get the same energy, but at a lower cost. And the same way, when we try to serve one another out of guilt and shame, it will give you a certain amount of energy. Yeah, like if I guilt trip you, right now if i was to guilt trip you about watching netflix which i do I, d I don't at the moment but i often do and if i was to guilt trip you about whatever the thing is and tell you you lot need to work harder to serve one another i bet it would have a certain amount of effect but the cost would be high because it would make you all feel rubbish and we'd go around serving one another out of guilt and shame. The cost is too high. We need to switch to a different energy provider. We need to switch 
to like some people switch to solar power, we switch to the Spirit's power. And we're like, we're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to serve one another. So we're not doing it in our own strength. We're doing it by the Spirit's power. And then it says, verse 17, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want. And I'm sure we can all identify with that, you know, where you're like, I want to do the right thing. I want to serve other people. And we end up not doing that. And we're like, ah, oh, man, why is that? It's because it's we go back to the old ways, the realm of the flesh. And then it says, verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality. Then he goes on to hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. So he's saying all those things, they're what come from the realm of the flesh. Whenever you find yourself engaging in these things, even if it's just the smallest amount, that is the realm of the flesh. But then verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which means patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law. So, so what it's saying there is that the Holy Spirit can produce in your life fruit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. So you see the, the problem I had where I thought my problem was a time problem. I changed my schedule to give myself more time, but I was still like, there's still a bad attitude. You know, the heart problem I can change my schedule, give myself more time, but if I'm still operating in my own strength, I won't love people the right way. But if I operate out of spirit's power, then I will love people with love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness. And we all know how important this is, right? Because you can love someone and help them out of a jam, but if they don't respond the right way, then it's easy to get impatient with them. But the third, the full fruit of the Spirit there, forbearance, patience, means that then when people don't respond the right way, we have more patience with them. We have more love with them. We're able to serve them better because we serve out of patience. So years ago, I was at this Christian function and there was someone there who did a great job serving all the food. You don't know who this person is and that they're not even alive anymore, but they served all this food. I thought they was doing a great job. I'm thinking, rah, look how good they are at serving all that food. And then I went into the toilets. They came in, not knowing I was in there, and they just started, they were angry. And they just started saying out loud how annoyed they were at having to serve everyone and everything. And I was shocked. I was like, I didn't know that. They, they put on a mask. They sort of grinned and bared it to serve people they didn't really want to serve. And the thing is, over the years, I see I can do exactly the same thing sometimes where I serve people out of my own resource and my own strength. And I don't enjoy doing it. And I get fed up with people doing it. I get impatient as I do it. And the answer is not to keep on putting on a mask and grinning and bearing it. The answer is to switch to a different energy provider, to switch to solar power. So all you've got to do is get on your knees and say, Lord, give me your spirit's power. I need your help to help me to serve people. I can't do it in my own strength. And so then in verse 24, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry about that. In verse 24, he says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So there's a sense in which when Jesus died, we died with him, right? And the old way of doing things in the realm of the flesh, we were crucified to that. And now we live a new way according to the spirit. So it says in verse 25, since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the who? The spirit, keep in step with the spirit. So now that we've got this new life, we believe in Jesus, we're given his spirit, now keep in step with the spirit. Now in the army, when they're all marching, you know, have you ever wondered how do they manage to put their left and right foot in the right place at the right time? Well, you have one bloke who's shouting, lift, 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 right, lift. And you hear him and you know, oh, left, left, 
left, right, left. And that helps you keep in step and you will march in step. It's by listening. Same way, how do we keep in step with the Spirit? By listening to the Spirit. How do we listen to the Spirit? Well, the, the obvious way is with the Bible, right? As, as we read the Bible, we are listening to God's Spirit-breathed Word, right? It's amazing. Both God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are actually active in communicating truth to you. So we, we read the Bible that keeps us in step with the Spirit. We've all had experiences, haven't we, where we've read the Bible and we've suddenly been like, either like, oh, I should pray for so-and-so, you know, because you've read something about praying for one another or Paul asking people to pray, and you're like, I, I should start praying. Um, and or things where you actually change the direction of your life. You read something, you're like, I gotta stop doing that. I gotta start doing this, you know? But also, how do we keep in step with the Spirit? Having big eyes having big eyes so that we see the needs around us because it says in the Bible that the Holy Spirit has arranged everyone in the church just as he sees fit. So he's actually handpicked us in our small little church family. He's handpicked us and arranged us as he sees fit. And part of the reasoning behind that is so that we would help one another. So if you have a need and I don't see it, hopefully there's someone else who's seen it. You know, and, and together we actually see one another's needs and we can help one another. And, and the Holy Spirit prompts you. You know, the Holy Spirit prompts you. It puts people on your, on your heart and think, I need to pray for that person. Or someone shares a need and you feel like, oh, I should, I should help them. And you offer to, to help them in some ways. And so we keep in step with the Spirit this, this way. Okay, now... Galatians 6, 7, so into the final chapter of Galatians where we started. It says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. A man reaps what he sows, or a woman reaps what she sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Okay, so this is really important because when we serve people and love one another, it's no good to just know, oh, they've got a need, I'll help them. It's so important how we help people, that we help people in the way that reflect, reflects Christ. You might have heard Paul Tripp's thing he does, you know, where he says, this cup of coffee, some of you know this isn't actually coffee, but let's pretend it is. This cup of coffee, if I shake it, coffee's going to go all over the floor. Why, why does coffee go all over the floor? Anyone? Because I, I shook it. And then he says, what if I word it this way? Why does coffee come out of the cup? Because coffee's in it in the first place, right? So sometimes we get shaken, we get shaken and bad stuff comes out, either what we say or how we say it. And we're like, oh, sorry, I got shaken. <laughs> But Jesus said, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So Jesus tells us that when we say bad things, when we do bad things, it comes out of where? Comes out of our hearts, yeah? The, the coffee only comes out of the cup because the coffee's in there. So what that means is that when we serve people in an unloving way, it's not because we got shaken. It's not because our schedule was too busy. Obviously, these things are factors. Uh, please understand, I'm not being heartless here. I'm not saying you all need to work more hours, work harder and love more. That's not what I'm saying, okay? You need to take care of yourself. God created you as a physical being who has to have rest, okay? But too often we think it's our environment that made us be unloving and we forget it comes from our hearts. So Paul says, if you sow to please the flesh, you will reap from the flesh. And then you know, in the chapter before in 519, he lists the acts of the flesh, sexual immorality. So if you've been dabbling in sexual immorality in some way, there will be a consequence in your actions. Don't expect that you can serve people well if you've been dabbling in this. Now, in case there's anyone who's like, well, it's not me, I'm perfect. Look at other things in there, verse 20, hatred. If we've been hating people, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, 
selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and, and even envy, just envying someone. Oh, they got more time than me. That's envy right there. We can't serve someone well when we're feeling that way about them. So there's all these things we do that feed the flesh and they, they result in us not serving people well. They result in us not being a loving community that can love others. But the good news is we don't have to feed the flesh. We can feed the what? The spirit. We can sow to please the spirit. Yeah. And so this is what some people call means of grace. You know, ways that you get special assistance from the Holy Spirit in your life. And it's a bit like, you know, when you fill a car up with petrol to give it fuel to run. There's ways that we get filled with God's spirit to help us serve other people in love, to, to love our neighbor as ourself. So for example, one of them would be reading the Bible. Getting in the word is like putting the petrol in, you know, and getting strength from the Holy Spirit. And another way is praying, praying to God. You know, and another is worshiping. Worshipping Jesus, it really does feed, feed your spirit. I, I can tell you times when I'm bedridden and I'm feeling so rubbish about myself. And one of the reasons why I'm feeling rubbish is because I'm thinking, well, how can I be of any use to anyone else when I'm stuck in my bed in so much physical pain, unable to move? One of the things consistently that I found has helped me has been worship. You know, turning my attention to God and how amazing God is. And also then I'm like, oh, I can be of use. I can worship God. That's a, that's a good thing to do. Um, but also having fellowship with other believers, as long as that fellowship doesn't result in hatred, discord, jealousy, you know, or, or, all that kind of stuff. So you see, there's things we can do to help us be filled with the Spirit, to be walking in step with the Spirit so that we love people right. And so now we can finish by going back to what we started with. At the end of Galatians, I read earlier out number 10, but let us read it in context. Galatians 6 verse 7. <coughs> Sorry. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So you see, with the Spirit's help, we can avoid being a holy huddle that only focuses on ourselves. We can be a blessing to people in Roehampton, but without the Spirit's help, we can't do it. So we don't have to just try really hard in our own strength. We need to rely on the Spirit and have big eyes that we see the opportunities between us and with the Spirit's strength, serve people. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would fill us up. We pray that you would help us to serve like Jesus served. We pray that you would give us big eyes, that we could see people like Jesus saw people. We pray that you would lead us so we would be like Jesus, who said he only do, did what he saw the Father doing. We just pray, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that you would lead us to know when there are these opportunities for us to do good to people. Forgive us of all the ways that we've served with hard hearts. Forgive us for all the ways that we fed the flesh. Please change us. And please, Holy Spirit, will you help us to keep in step with you? Help us to be more loving to everyone we come across in the coming week. Help us to be more like Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. We thank you for your cross. And we pray that you would help us to live out the reality of having been crucified with you at the cross and now rising again in the newness of spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.